Anything is possible. New freezer, it's a lot of them. I'm Who's back. Up? Let's do it. Happy New Year, Danny. How are you? Happy New Year. I'm good. How What's are you? So you know what? Surprisingly, I'm I'm good. We're we're bunkered down in Venice, trying to stay safe. LA is getting crazy. How's everything with you? Um, everything's good here. Miami is a little different. Everything's open. <laughs> we're like just wilding out. But um, I've been home. My husband's a doctor, so like this for the last eight months. Like I've been like in, a, but it's all good. I feel I feel like. Uh, we're like almost there. Like I'm seeing the vaccine stuff come out. Like everyone's going. Like there's some hope in the in the air. It's it's nice. It's fun. Yeah, I think uh, I'm I'm optimistic about 2021. Um, I do need to make a trip to Miami, and at some point we need to relaunch our our collab because what we what we did a sneak peek of that that product was epic. We'll make it happen. But um, pina colada pops for those who don't uh, who un weren't unreal. there. Un was... Cartel dream pops were were epic. Um, well, listen, number one, thanks for making the time. We're really excited to have you on. Congrats on Forbes 30 into 30 on all the success. You guys are Thank absolutely you. crushing it. Um, Thank you so much. I feel like I finally made it being on the podcast, to you, be honest. I'm like, we're you, on. <laughs> Stick with your dreams. Let's go. <laughs> well, I, you're also the first you know, company in the space, rum, spirits. Um, so we're, we're pumped that we can finally make this work. So. Um, awesome. Let's look, let's, let's dive in. Tell us a little bit about your background. Um, I know you grew up in Central America. You've tried a, you know, a couple different, you know, entrepreneurial pursuits, but how did you get into the coconut world, the coconut rum world? And, and tell us a little about yourself. It's a long story. So I'll try to not ramble for too long. But um, so my brother and I will go back because it all makes sense going back to the beginning. But all the way back. All the way back. Um, my brother and I, we were born in Miami, Miami Beach. Um, our parents are Latin. So our mom is Guatemalan and our dad is Venezuelan. So we grew up in like a Latin household. Um, and we moved back to, so we like kind of like reverse migrated to uh, Central America. When I was like nine, my brother was a little bit older. So I ended up like growing up in Central America. Like my whole childhood was really in Central America. So I lived in El Salvador and in Guatemala. Um, and so we grew up around agriculture, you know, like anywhere you drive around, like you go to the beach or whatever, like you're going through sugarcane fields and, and uh, coconut farms. And is, am I cutting out? Michael says that my internet is no. not great. No. Okay. You're so cool. You, you're cool. Mike, your internet sucks. Not mine. Sorry. That was my brother being like, your internet's not good. Um, anyway, so we're growing up around uh, agriculture and coconuts, obviously. So we'll get into that, but bananas, sugarcane, chocolate cacao coffee like this is just like stuff that's like in abundance everywhere so if you grew up in a city in the u.s it's just like so different um and so when i graduated high school in guatemala i moved to uh boston to go to babson college which is like number one school for entrepreneurship so that was uh i got my i guess my toolbox there on entrepreneurship and uh then we you know my brother i was in like uh senior year and he hits me up and he's like I have this idea I want to bring these coconuts from El Salvador to Miami and I'm like Mike that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Like, <laughs> don't call me like bye um but he ends up stuffing his suitcase with 200 of these little coconuts and smuggling them up to Miami so like the word you know the, the whole coconut cartel story is real we were smuggling some stuff so you literally um, packed suitcases full of coconuts from El Salvador. Yep. Like that. Epic. Like he, Epic. Yep. Awesome. He's like, these coconuts are so delicious. Like to drink the coconut water. I was like, I'm just going to bring them yeah. up. So he just stuffed his suitcase with them, brought them up. Um, and that little smuggle turned into like a container load a week. Like we built it from like moving it in suitcases to built, bringing up about a container load a week of these coconuts. And we supplied all the hotels in Miami beach, Royal Caribbean, like, all the way up to Montauk in the summers, like mostly East Coast. Um, so if you had a fresh coconut in the East Coast from 2012 to now, it was likely from <laughs> one of our farms. And we ended up reactivating about 10,000 acres of coconut farmland in the region. So it was like, it wasn't really being used for anything. Um, and we ended up building a little export industry there, which is awesome. And then 
how do we get into rum? We got into rum because we were selling rum in these coconuts, like really good rum, uh, Zacapa, Flor de Caña, like Central American rums, which we grew up around, which for us is kind of like what, you know, bourbon would be to someone from Kentucky. It's like what we're known for. Um, and so we started playing in that space and, and finally took the leap into bringing in our own product under the coconut cartel flag uh, in 2018. And now that business has definitely taken over the coconut business and is our primary focus. And so we're motivated to, uh, to just show everybody what we like, how much we loved rum and like in, in other parts of the world, like rum is, is looked upon as something like really different as what it is here in the States at the moment. And so we're going to sort of take that charge and make people love rum. I feel like rum is so underappreciated. First off, it's, it's amazing. Like when I think rum, Americanized rum, you're just thinking like Mai Tais, right? Like, or there are rum just a few Coke brands, or... Bacardi, what, right. you know, it, it, there's such an opportunity to kind of re rethink and breathe some life into that category. And I know it's one of the fastest growing in spirits. So really exciting, but let's go back yeah. to the coconuts. Cause when I first heard of you guys, um, I remember like I read an article about the coconuts and how you were branding the coconuts, doing some really interesting things like on social media, custom coconuts for different uh, venues, Soho House, other products to really gain the hype and, and momentum. But what were some of those initial challenges? You're, when you're talking about shipping and exporting produce to another country to, to then resell, plus you're doing it during the, correct me if I'm wrong, the coconut craze, Zico, Vita Coco, like what, can you talk to us a little bit about some like the horror story, some of the big wins, because that's, I mean, that's a, its own really exciting yeah. uh, entrepreneurial venture in and of itself. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I, I cut my teeth in that one. Like, yeah. I now nothing can really affect me because we went through the ringer <laughs> um, with the coconut business. But I mean, it starts off with, I guess, logistically, it was such a challenge. I mean, when we started it, you think about it, you think everyone's like, oh, it's so easy. Like, get a coconut off of a tree and sell it. Like, it seems like such a basic concept. But it's so it was so much more complicated than that starting from all right we started with one farm who you know had a basic operation of harvesting coconuts and then we outgrew that we needed more and so there were farm what what does that look like by the way like for someone who's never been to a coconut farm i've always wondered how do you even get coconuts down harvest them and and the supply chain behind that grow them what what does that look like (laughs) so okay so in our case the area that we started uh, harvesting from was planted over a hundred years ago by almond joy actually wow so they were yeah they were growing the meat there for their candies um and over the years that land was reappropriated and changed hands because of you know they moved they went to asia it's a much bigger coconut market in asia a lot more sophisticated coconut um processing there um but different people took you know, through civil wars and things that happened in Central America, then it just got split up and you have all these different farmers everywhere. So in the, in the, fir- the first farm we worked with was with a family that had a little coconut farm that they would just take, like they have this from, I mean, like from the seventies, this like kind of looks like a, a tower pulled by ox or oxen or what would be the <laughs> plural, for plural. With, <laughs> right, with these guys on the top of it with sticks that would hit the coconuts for them to come down. And there were rows of between the coconut trees that they would, the palm trees that they would roll the oxen, you know, the thing down and they would knock them down. Other farms, that was the most sophisticated one. The other farms didn't have anything. Like they had bush. Like we had to go in and clean out under the palm trees, like jungle forest. Um, And those we would actually have to send in our own harvesters because the, the owners of those farms were like, we don't harvest the coconuts. We actually just use the shade for coffee or cacao or whatever. But you can have the coconuts if you can get, get them down yourself. So that's what we did. We had people go and they would actually climb up the trees, wrap a rope around like bundles of coconuts and like shoot them down so they wouldn't crack when they hit the, hit the ground. And it was, there was that. There were like literally cartels, like, real ones like living yeah. out in some of those farms that we encountered at times and had to like isn't that crazy how few people like i just will drink coconut water and i don't even think about all the like like it's just so interesting how complicated how complex harvesting yeah. coconuts is then you have to crack them open like i don't even know what that process looks like right so okay <laughs> you, you're, you're harvesting and collecting coconuts you found a few like suppliers now talk about 
a shelf life and how the hell do you get coconuts over to to then start selling them and make sure that that's all food safe like how do you, i don't how does that work so we had to set up a facility that would receive all the coconuts and would peel them so we had like a team an assembly line of guys that were like peeling them with like machetes and you know they have like their own ways of doing things very manual yeah. machetes yeah. and then we would shave down the coconuts to like get like get it smoother so that then it would go to an engraving part of the facility where we would engrave our logo on it or a collaborative logo and then they were packed into produce boxes so kind of like when you see like pineapples come in like those you know like those big produce boxes that's how we packed it and then it would have to at that moment we started a, a cold chain and then the cold chain would start it would come up in a refrigerated container up to uh up to the u.s and it would have to stay cold chain until the moment that you would drink it so it was uh Sounds like a logistics company more than a food company. It was. That's what I'm saying. Like, I cut my teeth in logistics with that one. Like, anything else is, like, cakewalk. Three-tier system, alcohol and spirits, easy. No easy. problem. <laughs> no okay. problem. Okay. That one was challenging. We had three weeks of shelf life, if you can imagine. Like, three, oh so, wait. Yeah, you had three weeks of shelf life with your coconuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, like, the crazy. That's the craziest. They even, that's insane. Yeah, they were pre-sold, though, before they even hit the United States. What, you know what happens I mean? after three weeks? They just start molding or? Yeah, they start molding. They get like weird. Not good. I can't believe how fast can you get them over from El Salvador from tree into someone's hand at in Miami if, or. If you're air shipping it a day, but we were doing in containers, which is like five days. That's insane. Yeah, um, no, cause I, I, anyone that has under a six, eight month shelf life, I don't know. Like that's okay. So biggest challenge with that business also were there any other coconut players like yeah, was, that, started, was anyone yeah 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 we okay. had uh that's when things started getting interesting because we started having competitors we had like the thai coconuts which are like the white ones that you see everywhere with like the triangular mm -hmm. top those started flooding the market and those like not that they have more of a shelf life they don't but like they uh they're kind of like they have like a thicker they leave like a thicker shell on it so like you can't tell that they're getting nasty and so they yeah. last longer but no um, right but they started coming out on the market and then we had like some other people in the local area that started importing it from central america or whatever they started going to the farms and buying their own stuff and then going to the hotels and being like oh well we'll do well so first we would only brand them coconut cartel that's how we build the brand and then the competitors yeah. came in and they're like well we'll put your hotel logo on it well we'll, we'll put you know whatever fountain blue whatever and then obviously the client's like, well, we want our logo on it because people were like taking pictures of themselves, drinking it on Instagram. They want their logo on it. And then it started yeah. getting commoditized and we're like, hmm, this isn't good. We better make moves to do something that's, you know, more brand focused than, than a commodity. Like we're not a promo item. So that's when. So, the and so happened. when, 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 when Vita Coco and Zico are coming in, how does it affect your supply chain? It didn't affect my supply chain because those guys are so big that they're, they need, um, they need like Asian style, like the like volume, um, volume production. Yep. Yeah, like they my farms were like too small for them. There were plenty for us, but too small for them. Um, and it was just a different product. Like they were they're selling it as a health a health item that like a health food beverage that you get at Whole Foods or Grab and Goes. Um, we were selling it as like a lifestyle thing in hospitality. So you, you'll never drink. I'm not gonna say never because I've seen it, but like likely you're not going to be poolside or beachside in Miami beach drinking a Vita Coco on the pool, like at the pool. But if, so, if there's a coconut out, like someone sees it, they're like, Oh, I want one of those. Right. And they can make a cocktail in it. It's a vessel. It's like a cocktail vessel too. So it was more of a lifestyle thing. And that's where we segued into spirits because that's the game that we were playing. We weren't in whole foods. We weren't, making any we weren't even making any help and there was anymore. no there was no interest in going into retail you really like wanted to, or was it a literally as a supply problem like you just could not get enough it's product just, it was more of a perishability issue like how do you trust having a coconut on a shelf that it's going to be the cooler is cool enough that it's not too humid that it's like you know like people are touching it like it was retail very quickly became obvious that was not our game we were 100 percent oh. on premise experiential events did a lot of stuff with like the big liquor brands um so we knew we needed, we knew we needed to scale with something else we were actually thinking of like taking a harmless harvest on on the head and, and doing a bottled product at one point but well, so, so that's that's <laughs> that exactly so that's what i want to ask you because also 
you see the success of, of Coconut Cartel and where it is today. What most people don't see is the what, what, eight years, six, whatever it was, building the business prior to get to where you are now, which these things take five, 10, 20, 30 plus years to really scale. So that's just something I always love to dive into. You see these success stories, they're never overnight. Um, when it's, you're it's looking the at- It's 10 year overnight success, for real. E exactly. When you're looking at options, like what I would call this is not necessarily a pivot, but this is really where you guys are like, okay, we have something that people love. The logistics are so complex. This doesn't make sense to scale. What stopped you from going, let's create a premium harmless harvest type product or a Vita Coco or a dang coconut chip. Let's go into rum. Like you had to have done a full analysis of the whole coconut space. Were there other things that you were looking into? And what was that final, okay, rum is for sure what we're going to double down on and, and bet on? Yeah. So what we knew was that people loved coconut cartel, like the name it was sticky. Like people would try a coconut, like a, a coconut and five years later still remember that brand name. It's a great it's, name. It's, it's a great like, name. it's, it's, it's psychology, right? Like at some point, like it just sticks, it just worked. And people, you know, they recognize the name, they love the brand. They like the, the whole thing about it. And so we knew that the brand was really strong that we needed to just put it on a product that was scalable rum. You know, we, we looked at other things. We looked at, bottled coconut water we went to thailand we went we were looking at sri lanka like everywhere that we could get into the coconut water game in the bottle but coconut water was crazy there was like a crazy coconut water war um for a while and harmless uh you know they had the style of coconut water that pre we probably would have wanted to go into um but they had like fda issues at that time like they were blocking like HPP stuff started coming under scrutiny. It just started getting really complicated that we were becoming less, I guess, enchanted with it. Rum, on the other hand, came about like really organically and just something that we were passionate about <laughs> because we liked it. That's what we were drinking. Like we're not mezcal people. We're not tequila people. We drink rum. We were like drinking sacapa rum with our coconut water. And we started seeing what was going on in the tequila and mezcal space that like it went from being the stuff you used to shoot late night when you're like close to blackout, like a tequila. Like, think of what a tequila shot was like 10, 15 years ago. Like you're like, yeah, then it yeah. turned into like the spirit you're drinking at lunch and a cocktail. It's like a lifestyle spirit. Um, and that happened across the board in so many categories, like whiskey, like go down the whiskey aisle, you have bourbons, rye, like this distillery. I mean, you name it, you can have it. Craft all the way to big brand. Same story with like tequila and mezcal. So many cool little brands. Um, rum just didn't have, hasn't had that moment. You go down the rum aisle, it's kind of dusty and a little boring. Um, why yet. is that? Like, you know, why is like, is it just because like, there's Bacardi? Like who, who else is like a major like rum lifestyle brand right now? I don't know if there's like a lifestyle brand. But yeah. the big players are obviously Bacardi, Captain Morgan. Captain um, Morgan, right. Mm -hmm, they're big. Um, the fancier, you know, the high, the more premium ones are going to be the Central American spirits like Zacapa, which is a Diageo brand. You have Flor de Caña, which is William Grant. Um, and those are more like heritage legacy brands. Um, there are so many rum brands. If you go to Europe, there are so many craft rum brands like also cuban rum which we don't have here and i think that has a big part of it like cuban rum is all over europe it's not here um but there's no brand that people that you would like think that like people like want to wear their hat right like that's when you know you're like i want to rock this hat because it says you know dream pop on it but like in in a spirit like people love a casamigos hat like that logo was like pfft, they're like i'm a casamigo i'm the house of friends like Yep. There's nothing like that in rum. And that's sort of where we see it. We're like, let's just re per not repurpose, but represent something that we know is really good. Like we know like Guatemalans make dank rum. Like we grew up around it. Um, yeah. But people are not so into the legacy heritage thing. Maybe there are some people, but I think that refreshing the category and doing something a little bit more fun and jovial, but also super premium and like kind of like cool that they want to be like associated to it has been yeah. part of the success um and we're like a first mover nobody's really like 
paying attention to rum. Everybody's like, mezcal, tequila, mezcal. Every day there's a new tequila New tequila brand. brand. It's it's like, the Rock's I mean, tequila, tequila, Michael tequila. Jordan's tequila. Everybody. It's like, it's, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's like, why don't you do a coconut tequila? And I'm like, I'm not competing in that. Like no, everyone's doing don't that. Do that. It's nuts. So <laughs> we're kind of like over here, like we're going to go do our own thing over here. And you're uh, really smart because in five, 10 years when rum is the it spirit, you're going to be like, yep, we were just slow and patient. Um, okay. So I, by the way, if anyone hasn't done this, go look at the video um, of the Ziggs heading to Guatemala, because when you guys, I, I, the more content you guys can share that it's, it's really amazing. Like I've never seen a rum distillery, but can you talk a little bit about, you know, the roots there, the process of creating the special coconut rum and this, the distillery that you guys have a relationship with? Yeah. Um, so, okay. So like I said, Guatemalans make amazing rum. It's something that's been, it came with the Spaniards. Like we do a Spanish style rum. You get similar style rums in, uh, in Nicaragua and Panama. Like a, it's a little bit different from like Caribbean style rums because um, it's distilled from a sugarcane syrup versus a molasses. So okay. um, usually like rum is distilled from molasses, like a blackstrap molasses. Um, but in Central America, they're sort of known from doing it from like a, a syrup, which is like less processed. So we work with a distillery there that is uh, it's a family owned distillery. Um, they have a few of their brands um they don't really come to the u.s themselves like they produce for you know other brands in, in the u.s but when we approach them like they make one of the best rums in the world and i can't name it because it's like that big but uh they um when we approach them we came to them with a unique concept we said to them like we want to combine we want to bring coconut into the rum space in a way that's not like sunscreen to put a better you know like coconut yeah. rum is is like it tastes like copper tone so like how you know how can we bring together these two flavor profiles that like naturally go together and um don't taste like fake so at the beginning they were skeptical they're like you want to put coconut water in our rum it's like going to it's like you know it's like making a sangria out of like a phenomenal uh you know wine or something they were yeah. appalled um so we're like, no, 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 we're good. it's, it's going to be great. They're like, okay, cool. We'll sell you barrels at start at the start. They're like, we'll sell you the barrels. You can pick some barrels and we have access to their, um, their super añejos, like any age rum that we want to get, they've allowed us, um, access to them. And the way that we, and that's also access, called an añejo. Yes. Yes. Okay. I didn't know that. So an añejo for rum as well. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And so, I mean, I guess the way that we got in there was just relationship based. Like you just don't like we're Guatemalan and that helped, but you, it's not like Mexico that you can, there's like mega factories that you can just like, go down and like make a white label tequila. It's just not an option there. You have to have a relationship. And so Michael, my brother, um, who's my partner for- Shout out you know, to he, Jet Lag Zig because he's, <laughs> he's the man. <laughs> uh, he keeps bogging me that I need a, a ring light. Is it bad lighting? I don't think I have bad lighting. No, light it's right great. Now. Come on. <laughs> you need come a on, ring light. I'm like, everyone needs to calm down with their ring lights. I think, you know, it's fine. Um, but my brother just basically got to know these people, like, would go and have drinks with them and get their trust. And, like, it took two years of the schmoozing until finally they were like, all right, fine, we'll, we'll, we'll work with you. And they gave us access to the Rangiejo. So they don't sell anything above three years age to anybody. And we're, we get up to like 28 if we want. So our blend has four, eight and 12. Um, and anyway, so they sell me the barrels and we bring them up to Miami on our first two batches. Everything's done like in a batch. And my brother and I literally <laughs> blended these, these, these first batches ourselves. We had like coconut water, this rum, like, a big like you know mixing tank and we were making the rum on our own on the first two <laughs> the first how do you blend. so you got barrels of rum delivered to you or was it just like a i don't know vessels of rum you take coconut water and you're just like blending like how do you like yeah we well, let's yeah, go I mean, yeah yeah we had to i mean we had to <laughs> yeah i mean seriously david like how else does shit get done you just fucking that's do how it. you do it you just that's fucking how do you it. do you're it like, we're gonna do this. yeah and we did it we just like we're obviously we had to work at like a food safe place right. that had a license to process alcohol but like we just walked in here with like barrels of rum coconut water and we're like Epic. we're just gonna we're just gonna fucking do this blended yeah. it put it in a bottle like you know obviously there's a whole process of like design and whatnot but um but 
those first two batches and I had a bottle and I was back to square one. It was like the coconuts before I was like a bottle of rum and my backpack. And I just started hitting the streets and we started selling it. Once the distillery saw that they were afraid of processing coconut water because they knew that that stuff is crazy. It is, but we knew all about it. Like I knew all, I, I knew every single freaking coconut water processing method that you could ever imagine because we were looking into this. What were they and, for? Uh, were, what were they were? Because they're using typically what is what goes into rum. It's molasses, and and then they're using just water, or is there some, so, something else? So they'll distill, they'll ferment molasses or like a syrup, and then they'll distill that. It'll go through a still. And so there's like different types of still. There's pot still, which is like super popular in Jamaica. Um, the one that we use is a copper column still. So like long columns. Um, and then that's distilled, right? So you have a distillate, which is like just pure alcohol. That is actually for everyone, you know, everyone thinks that like alcohol, I mean, rum is uh, sugar water. It's not, it doesn't have, it's alcohol. It's the same as every other alcohol comes out of a still. It's just plain alcohol. doesn't have sugar in it. That goes into a barrel and sits forever, as long as you wanted to, right? So in our case, we have up to 12 years age. So we put it in American white oak barrels. They're charred in the inside. They'll burn the inside of the barrel. They'll put the, the distillate in there. And then it's kind of trucked up to, to the, the uh, aging house. And it just sits there. Um, and then and the coconut we, so water every, goes into those copper, copper, tu those copper tunnels. No. So the way the coconut water in there, so every, every alcohol, when it comes off of the still is like a super high proof, like it's really high, like level of alcohol. You can't drink that. Um, and when it's in a barrel, it comes out at like, I think our barrels, they come out at 62% alcohol. Um, okay. So like a, a bottle's 40% alcohol. You don't even look at it. It's like 40% ABV on it. We bring it from 62% to 40% with coconut water. Typically, any spirit uses water. And you'll see like whiskey brands that'll be like, we use spring water from Utah, whatever. Yeah. To make our <laughs> and that's where they get their claim of like, it's that's where they get like their minerality or their smooth, like how smooth their blend is or whatever from the type of water they drink or they, they blend it with. We use coconut water. So it was like a Got really it. random innovation that nobody has thought about that we did that. So it's, 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 it's a complicated thing to explain, but that's how we get the coconut water in there. And it gives it like a really nice mouth feel. But that's true legs. differentiation where no yeah. one has, has really pushed the limit on blending rum no. like that. So that's, no. that's really, and, and can I ask, was your bottle custom too? Because that cap and bottle are so beautiful. Like, how did you think about designing that? Um, so it's not custom, but we're like the only people to use that design really in the world from our suppliers as a French class company. Um, Got it. But when we thought of like designing, we just wanted it to look, and it's all like me and Mike, like, honestly, it's like, just like we ordered and it's just doing it, David, again, it's just like, how no, but and, and, ev and, and, and everyone thinks like, oh, you got to go hire an amazing design firm, like, what you guys are able to accomplish, it's just hustle. It's great. It's, it's like, just hustle. I like not, not going single... with stock. Yeah. yeah. Just like, I'm going to look up every single bottle company in the, in the world and I'm going to order samples from everybody and I'm going to figure it out. That's what we did. We ordered samples yep. from everybody found this bottle. Okay. We like this. Um, and then our labels, like a Frankenstein, we worked with like so many like different designers. We took this from this one, this one from that one and put it together. And, um, but we wanted it to feel like, super super premium that it just looks gorgeous on your bar um but the price point worked out in such a way that you don't have to feel bad drinking it it's the same price as like a casamigos 36.99 like share it with your buddies like give it as a gift it's not a problem but it looks gorgeous on your bar you feel like you have like a 90 dollar japanese whiskey you know it's it, it looks really premium so where you guys are today i, I saw you know over 450 to 500 plus locations in the u.s um Talk to me a little about where's the company headed in 2021. I saw there's, you know, some international growth as well. Um, you know, what, what can we look forward to as you guys, you know, continue growing? Oh my God, there's so much, David. It gives me anxiety, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, so this year we have, we're, you know, we, COVID was a big turning point for us, it was like a really crazy moment, uh, an amazing moment. It pushed us into a place where we weren't before, um, which is online, which for the liquor space is really new. Nobody is 
that wasn't a thing and in our space and you touched upon it a minute ago there's something called the three-tier system where it means that you can't sell direct to consumer you have to go through a distributor and it's just like this regulatory stuff um and so when COVID happened we were you know 95 percent of our business was on premise meaning bars and restaurants so obviously that shut down and uh i'm in my like honeymoon at this moment i got married march 8th and then like the 13th this gets announced i'm in mexico oh my god like, oh my god i'm like literally sitting on the beach in mexico looking at my husband like my business just died what the fuck yep. like oh my god but no luckily um Two years ago, a little company here in Florida started doing some like quasi DTC stuff for spirits brands where you can like set up an online store that like looks like it's for the brand, like it's a whole branded experience um, and you can ship pretty much nationwide. So we're in 40 states now online. Um, we what, what's the for- company called? Um, there's a bunch of companies now. There's like Speakeasy out of California. There's Cask and Barrel here in Florida. There's Thirsty out of New York. So like this is a new thing. So you're going to start seeing a lot more like craft brands being able to like distribute nationwide. How does it's how does it work around the three tier system? It works with a network of retailers. So it all goes through like a distributor and a retailer. So like the thing about the three tiers is that each state wants to get their tax. As long as they get their tax, it's cool. So you need to have retailers and like these regions so like the orders come in and to the customer they feel like they're just buying it from you know whatever the brand but really it's like feeding out to a network of retailers who then will fulfill it and ship it to you so it's like so so you ship you ship coconut cartel to 40 different states to hubs correct and then the orders go through one back end and go to that specific retailer and then they fulfill within that state and then they get the tax within that state and that never existed never existed before you had to have just physical distribution in each state which is like a limiting factor like state by state by state that's so, so interesting. we're going hard yeah i mean it's so new it's literally like this year it popped off this concept so like we're going hard on being like one of the first brands to build themselves digitally right like we're just going hard on the content online educational component and the ability to have a call to action shop now Boom. And are you selling it through your site or through the shop that they've set up the back it's, end? It's my, it looks like my site. Shopcoconutcartel.com, full branded mm-hmm. experience, but it's fully compliant on the back end with like having this like fulfillment house take care of it. So we're going to go hard on that. We're going to go hard on, you're going to see us on a lot more, like there's a lot more, uh, you know, online stuff happening in liquor in general. Like you have like these membership clubs like Flaviar, you have like big marketplaces like Reserve Bar, you have direct to con- like direct delivery stuff like GoPuff is launching so GoPuff just bought Bevmo in California why because they're going to be distributing liquor across that state so like we're going hard online and that's going to be a big thing for us this year um, we have multiple states opening from Georgia Texas Massachusetts Connecticut California like all opening physical distribution um, and that's all driven by data that we've gotten this year through online like those are my top states I know I have customers there Um, And so how are they finding you? Are you doing paid? Like what channels are you marketing through and how are they discovering coconut cartel? We've done a lot of paid stuff um, to, and that's been amazing at just like, you know, understanding where we have customers coming from. Like these are people that otherwise would never be exposed to our brand. So a lot of, we did do, we're doing a lot of paid stuff, um, building out, uh, you know, relationships, like I said, with like a reserve bar and go puff and these, instacart and mini bar and like these guys also get you you know brand awareness um a lot of social a lot of you know podcasts lots of like anything we could like bacardi's not doing this they're not like getting on like they're not on the hustle, of course not. on the bottom end hustle so like we're doing that um they also don't have you guys who are every day at it athletes making it happen building the brand telling your story happen. which is powerful um yep. And, and by the way, this is such a common trend and pattern. Like you have these big corporate players who just, they don't have that hunger and that drive to find new arbitrage opportunities. And, you know, I've no doubt, you know, you're on their radar already. Um, oh, for and sure. We feel, with, we see you. They're, they're like half a mile away from me right now. Yeah, <laughs> they, they definitely see you. Um, with, do you have any tips for other spirits brands trying to like with, with their marketing? Where, what's been great for you guys? Facebook, Instagram? Uh, you know, where, where, and are there limits to what you can post for an alcohol and spirits brand or is it? Um, yeah, there are, there are rules. Um, but 
shouldn't limit you. Um, yeah. For us, I think it, it's also about finding your platform and you start understanding that with like data. For us, it's Facebook. Our customer is, and this is all learning, by the way, like before we just like had no idea. Um, our customer is a little bit older, um, tends to like shift a little bit more male um, and they live on Facebook. But for other brands, I've seen some other uh, spirits brands um, they do really well on on Instagram. So it's like finding it's it's about finding your platform. I think Pinterest is about to pop off for spirits too. Like they're doing there's a lot of interest there. Like think of like people DIY people learning to cook. They like recipes, cocktail recipes, like that sort of thing. Wherever that type of content is being played out is important. TikTok hasn't started doing alcohol ads yet, but I have seen brands start to like pop off there. Like Empress Gin has been doing a really huge like grassroots um awareness uh campaign through tiktok creators and stuff so um i think that if you're starting a spirits brand you're also the big brands are a lot they have a big legal department that says no to everything when you're yeah. a little guy you can get away that's with your whatever. opportunity that's your opportunity like kind of like i i watch your liquid death um podcast and uh you just have to be like kind of rogue like take advantage of like being able to be rogue when you're little um, and leveraging all social and stuff to do something a little avant-garde um, and go for it. But I think that for the biggest thing for spirits brands who are starting out is understanding um, the players that can help you and the platforms that are out there. Like you have uh, Park Street Imports, which is like our importer, which helps us with all the compliance and back end stuff. And they can help you distribute at the beginning. So we, they have like a delivery system that will allow you, to deliver with them. So we do, we did New York, California, and Florida with them. And I didn't have to have a distributor. I didn't have to have someone sign a contract with me. It was just like me, a bottle of rum, a backpack, and they would come and deliver. I'd put in the order, they would come and deliver. So like just understanding like every key like layer in this thing, having a partner that's like, do that's you know, the right partner in each layer. And if you need more help, like DM me because <laughs> nobody's really like, you just, I, I'll, you got to figure it out. But um, the point is there are resources out there now that will allow you to be a small spirits brand and to launch a brand. Whereas 10 years ago, that was nearly impossible because the gatekeepers kept you out. There was just no way for you to do it, but now you can when you put things in perspective, look how big your business has, has gotten and is like the rate at which you're growing. I can, I can only imagine like, like previously when people were looking at the spirit space, it always felt like you had handcuffs because of this state by state regulatory issue. Mm -hmm. um, but sounds like alcohol is about to just continue exploding and that there's, I, I mean, yeah. I had no idea about these, these backend sites that are doing that. So that's awesome. Um, any other tips for just general founders who are looking to jump into beverage or pro, or, you know, any CPG product or brand? Um, and, you know, have you had moments, you know, it sounds like you've had moments where you're like, man, all right, we're, you're, we're done here. And you've been at it for almost 10 plus years now. Um, you know, what, what tips do you have for people looking to come into the space? Tips. You know what? I think the less, you know, the better. So true. <laughs> you know the better um no but really it's all about your team um it's gonna be so hard yeah and my like my brothers are nothing perishable nothing Try perishable nothing. <laughs> Try tell nothing. me about it <laughs> um but no if you're if you're seriously thinking about starting anything um you need to have a couple great partners because it's going to be a hard journey and you're just going to figure it out and just go for it. Like, I don't even know how else to say it more than just like, just jump in the pool, just fucking do it. You'll go figuring it out as, as, as it's going. Um, I think that there's like small little things that you, when I think about it, not being in the liquor space, if I wasn't in the liquor space, there's so many little ways that you can test any type of concept that is such a low investment. You can like, like go to a farmer's market in your neighborhood. That is like the weekend farmer's market and set up a booth with your like, you know, very basic concept, like you're making soups, you're making ice cream, you're making whatever it is that you're making, as long as you're not an alcohol, I can't do that. But if you're in that <laughs> space, any beverage, like, the world is entrepreneurial now. It is not about like corporation anymore. Like nobody's looking to go be in the corporate setting. So there's just a million platforms that you can take advantage of to start small, test your concept and, and then take it and then and take it online. Like take it online, you'll, you'll, you'll gain so much data from that understanding of who your customer is, where they're at, what gets them going, like 
what kind of content works for them. Does your brand speak to them? You'll learn so much so quick um, and be nimble, just like make moves um, and use that information. But uh, I think, I think that just, just do it, just get going and like find a way to like put that, make that first sale is, is the move. I love it. I love it. Well, Danny, I'm, I'm the biggest fans of the Zig fam and, and <laughs> biggest, shout out to Lena, Lena as well. Um, love coconut cartel. Any last things that you want to share, like any new innovation coming or not quite yet, anything we should uh, keep an eye out for as you guys keep, you know, scaling. Yeah, no, we're, we're because of this online ability. Now we have the ability to, uh, sell whatever we want without the restrictions of anybody. So we have a few uh, new items in the pipeline from a, a line of bitters. So we want you to look at rum as the same way that uh, Michael's stopping. He's like, you can't ever <laughs> <laughs> um, <I saw. laughs> Guys, this is what happens when you work with your siblings. It's like they're like fucking with you at all times. Um, no, um, so we want to, you know, we're a rum brand and we want you to see rum as the same way that you'll see whiskeys and bourbons and things like that. So, um, and not just like your rum and Coke, even though I love a rum and Coke, don't get me wrong, that's like my favorite, but um, we'll, we're putting out a line of bitters. We're going to, we're playing on a line of, of canned cocktails, obviously, because that's like the new thing, but. Yeah. RTD makes RTDs, so much sense. So is it, yeah. so is like cocktail syrup, is it when you say bitters, like cocktail syrups also, like anything to complement your your so, beverage or my tire or whatever syrups yet but we're gonna do uh it's a line of three bitters that'll be just like for like an old-fashioned sort of concept the cool. cans are more on like the hard soda side so think of like your classic i don't know you know your classic dr pep or something like you know old school sort of vintage soda styles with uh sounds with, amazing like, solid rum yeah it's they're really good um, when when are those all 2021 or like next yeah. two years or no that's really well because like we get to test it we're it's all going to be tested online we'll just do like a small batch we'll put them up online if people are digging them we'll go for it if they're not digging them no harm done move on yep that's what you got to do like keep coming up with new things no just question. get it out there um so we're going to do the cans we're going to do the bitters um and then we're look we're working on a couple new añejo tropical añejo blends so like Stuff, same concept. You drink it neat on the rocks, like super premium rum. You can mix it if you want, but it's going to have some different um, tropical flavor infusion. So just give it a little flair. So we have a lot of, a lot of shit. <laughs> well, I'm pumped. I'm pumped for the cans. Um, speaking of which, I'm going to, I'm going to order some, some coconut cartel now because yes. when I had it last, I loved it at uh, summit. But oh, we Danny just came out with batch four. So you're going to get the new batch, batch if you order it right now. And that is the smoothest blend yeah. yet. Done and Very done. Good. But we need some, we need some dream bites. That's what we're waiting for over here. We need to do some coconut cartel, pina colada dream bites. That would, I'm that would all kill about it. That. <laughs> yes. I'm into it. So down. So down. Um, epic. Well, Danny, thanks for hopping on. This has been amazing. Um, congrats on everything. Congrats on the Forbes 30 under 30 well-deserved and thank you, thank hopefully you. I'll be seeing you in Miami or, or in LA and we'll be, uh, we'll be drinking your rum. So great, you great let, catching up. Let me know when you're here. We'll, uh, we'll take you out. We're open. We are open for business. Let's go. <laughs> no, just kidding. Everybody wear your mask. Like seriously. <laughs> 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 Peace out. Love it. Bye. Thanks. Danny. Bye. Thank you.